No name above that name, folks. Jesus. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 with me this morning, please, in verse number 12. I have before me a book that I believe. I hope you believe yours. I believe it from cover to cover. I let it critique me. That's right. It's a discerner, the thoughts and intents of the heart. Discerners, kritikos in Greek. We get our English word critique straight from that language. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Father, bless your word now. Your holy name, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul, writing the church at Corinth, had a lot of problems. They doubted his, uh, his uh, apostleship. They doubted his calling. They doubted his authority to write scripture. They doubted his authority, period. A lot of times say they, I'm not saying all that Corinth did, but uh, there was a considerable faction. And the Apostle Paul told him, he said, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought by me, he said, I am one that was born out of due season. In plain words, he said, I was before, born before my time. Uh, the word uh, is abort, literally. I was brought forth uh, for a specific purpose and reason. And then he says to these people at Corinth, be very careful. You had a man in your midst who was, uh, had his father's wife. And this, of course, is a, a disgusting, uh, abominable thing. Should be for anyone. And, uh, and yet he said, some of you were, instead of being convicted by it and praying for the need of the power of the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in your midst, uh, you were puffed up because you were comparing yourself with him and comparing themselves with themselves. The scripture says, they are not wise. Don't ever compare yourself with another sinner and uh, look around. All you have to do, matter of fact, uh, this morning when I got up, I shaved the face of a sinner. I bathed his body fed him breakfast, you know, took care of him. Uh, it's a sinner. And I looked into the mirror and to those eyes looking at me and I said to that sinner, I said, you sorry low down dog. I know where he came from. There's two of him. There's the old one and the new one, the old man and the new man. And so I will never forget that as long as I'm alive. So he said, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. And of course that begs the question, then if you're not standing on your own, how are you standing? Well, the apostle said in 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Notice the wording, it's important. He said this, he said, I know whom I have believed. He did not say, I know in whom I have believed, although he does believe in him. But what he's saying is, I know him. I know his character. I know who I'm talking about. And that's important because he said, he's able to keep that which I've committed to him. And I stand the same this morning. I have committed to him the most precious of all, me. <laughs> and I hope you have too. Your soul should be kept in the hands of one much bigger than you. In Jude verse 24, it says, Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. So you get a simple thing and understand it, that you cannot keep yourself saved. I don't care how hard and how meaningful, I don't care how dedicated, I don't care how, how you, are, uh, you are, you know, you're, you're part of that scene today. You cannot keep yourself saved. That's the work of God and only God. This is why he said in John chapter number 10 and verse number 26, but ye believe not because you're not of my sheep as I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. There is no greater security than that. This is something that you should think long and hard on. You might want to go back and review some of the comments that I made this past Wednesday night. I'm going to give you just a little of what I said. Your salvation is dependent upon God's word. His word. 
This is what he said I will do. He said, I will do this. I will give unto them eternal life. His word is an extension of his character. It represents God and who God is. If God gives you something and then takes it back, his word is meaningless. It is his word that he gives you. Now listen carefully. The actual gift could be anything. It's not the issue about the gift. The issue is about the word of the one who gave it to you. Amen. Is he able to do what he said he would do? Can anyone steal from him what is most precious of, of yours? No. So therefore, if you give someone a gift and then take that gift back, it was not a gift. It was a lie and it was a deception. So he said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Do I, do I, do I rest my soul and my eternity upon that statement this morning? Absolutely. I'll not rest it upon myself or my ability to keep or sustain anything. I'll rest it upon his promise, his word, his character. God cannot lie. Amen. But the Bible said in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12, verses 5 through 6, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. You've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as, un, as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Am I a son? Do I belong to the Lord? Or am I delusional? Am I someone steeped in modern religion? Or the things that I believe, are they real enough to change who I am? And give me absolute security. The Bible says in the book of Galatians chapter number 6 and verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Have you ever seen a brother or a sister fall? Have you seen their life come crashing down around them? How did you feel? Did you take some inner gleed? Did you feel good about that? Did that make you feel strong? Did that lift you up? Then you're a very weak, low person. If you have to find someone that's fallen to make you feel better and stronger, you're a weak indeed. The Bible says that if you are spiritual, you see one overtaken in a fault, you restore that one. You see, my dear friend, there's an awful lot of people that sit around people who are falling or have fallen or are about ready to fall and their spiritual discernment tells them there's something wrong. If you are truly spiritual, as the Bible says, you'll start praying for that individual. You'll intercede for them. You will. Maybe you've been down that same road. Maybe you're seeing some young person, some teenager, go down the same road you went down 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. And you know where that road leads. That should put you on your knees. That should cause you to pray for them. Hebrews 12, 5 said, You've ex You have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. And then he says in chapter 12, verse 7, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? This chastening from the hand of God is a mark, a sign that you have legitimacy. You belong to him. There's no question about it. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. If you endure chastening, that word endures from the Greek word eupanemeno. Eupameno. Meno in Greek means to remain, retain, to stay, to steadfast. And here's what this means. To stay in a place beyond an expected point of time. To maintain a belief or course of action in the face of opposition. And to wait for with persistence. If you are going through one of the most trying times in your life, it's trying you and testing you beyond measure. And you may not even be able to, to, to pinpoint something in your life that you might blame on. Or you might, you might say, this is the reason for it. Be patient. Wait upon the hand of God. If God has a message for you, he will get it across to you. He will speak to you. But you don't know how many layers 
of philosophy and psychology and experience and counseling and everything that you've seen and what people have said to you. All these layers of that stuff, sometimes you've got to get through that to get down into the heart and into the soul. Amen. You live in a generation today that spins everything and justifies it all. And that has an effect upon the way we think. And you carry that into the church and a lot of preachers carry it into the pulpit. And they're preaching the same thing to you that you get out there. They just wrap it up in a religious garb and that's all they do for it. Chastening is a mark that God loves you and you belong to the Lord. It's, for, it's, it's not for destructive purposes. It's not punishment. It is instructive. It's to teach you. It's, it's to help you. That's what it's about. And then he said in 1 John 5, 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. So you must have the spiritual discernment to know when someone staggering around drunk, fornicating, lying, cheating, stealing, saw I low down. You saw, oh, now preacher, I, church I go to, they don't do that kind of thing. You live in, you live in la-la land. You're delusional. Everything in the world that's ever been done has walked through the doors of this building. Amen. 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 Oh, Lord of mercy, I'm not coming back here. I'm going to find me a perfect church. The minute you walk through the door, it won't be perfect. Amen. <laughs> Come down to reality, folks. When sinners begin to condemn sinners, we got a problem. Let the condemnation come from the word of God. Let it be done by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Let God begin to search the reins and the soul and speak to the heart. Unlock what a man can do. You got to be awful careful when you get into this kind of thing. Do I condone sin? Good night, no. I want it out of my life. I want it purged. I want it cleansed from my soul. But I want somebody bigger than me to tell me what needs to be done in my life. Don't you? God goes to the source of the problem, to the root of the issue. He doesn't put band-aids on us. He goes to the heart of what needs to be done. If you'll trust him, he'll talk to you. And he said, if a man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Now look at this. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. In plain words, if you see your brother, you're spiritual enough to understand. He's going down a path and the chastening hand of God has touched him and it hadn't stopped him. It hasn't directed him. And he continues in willful rebellion against God's moving in his soul. Then he is crossing a line. And I don't know the line. Only God knows it. But when he crosses that line, he crosses that line into the sin unto death. What do you do? Lord, I pray he doesn't cross that line. That's my prayer. I pray he or she doesn't cross that line. I pray you get their attention before they go, to, go so far. Help them, Lord. Intercessor is such a wonderful ministry. The apostle says in Ephesians 4, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Well, I thought he forgave me because I prayed. I thought he forgave me because I meant well. I thought he prayed. I thought he forgave me because I was honest in my. No, he forgave you for Christ's sake. He has to forgive you on a level that is much higher than your ability to attain it. He has to be just and the justifier of him that believeth upon Christ. And the justification can only come through the just one. And the only righteous one that ever walked the face of this earth was the Lord Jesus Christ. All of our righteousness is filthy rags. There's only been one righteous soul that's ever lived on this planet. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And he was the perfect sinless son of God. Now listen to this prayer. After this manner pray. Our father which art in heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. If ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, 
Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Unforgiveness. You know, I'm a pretty transparent preacher. Three o'clock this morning, God spoke to me. I always know when he does. <laughs> Got up to use the bathroom, had no idea I was coming in a close encounter with God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. On the way to the bathroom, he met me. <laughs> But when he speaks, he speaks, and he knows how to speak, and hey, I know when it's him. He said, now, son, I want this, 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 and this. I said, yes, Lord. I knew it was him, and so it is, and so it was. You see, I've been wrestling around, and I know when it happens with a little hate trying to build up inside. I'm the kind of person, I got a, I got a temper. How many got tempers in here this morning? Lord of mercy, I got a temper. Got me in trouble before. Oh, I got a temper. And uh, you know, Moses had a temper, so you know, you, you still go to heaven with a temper. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Bible said, be angry and sin not, right? <laughs> Amen. I'm, I, pious folks always have a hard time when you start preaching to them, you know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> come down off your high horse, folks. Let's, let's get down here where, where we are, where, where, where the rubber meets the road, where we live. Yeah. Amen. I've got a temper. I can get angry. I can get mad and I can say things that I regret later. I wish I hadn't said them. Regret it. But I did it anyway. You see? But when something continues and eats and continues and eats and continues. I've never been the kind of person that hated. But I could feel it beginning to rise up inside me. Hate. Hate. Beginning to take root. And that's when God met me at the door. Because he knew it. Nobody else had to know anything, but he knew it. And it's, all, it's something about that that just sets the soul free. Because he knows. How many of you following what I'm saying today? Are you listening to me? Yeah, he did. He said, all right, son, that's far, that's far enough. Let's talk. And I had to deal with that issue. Get it out. Get that out, the hate. It's one thing to get mad, but there's something else. Now listen to this. I got on the internet a few minutes ago before I came. Here's what one doctor says. He says, hate, even strong feelings of anger or disgust are not the same as hate. Definition, hate is a profoundly intense and enduring dislike for someone or something. Hate can be tenacious and often has roots in mistrust, fear, or lack of individual power vulnerab or vulnerability, says Dr. Karn. I don't know the man, but I agree with what he says. I think this is a pretty good analysis of what hate is. Is there somebody in this house sitting here listening to me this morning that there's somebody in this world you despise and you want to hurt them? Now you're on the precipice of hate. You want to hurt them? You want to take them down? Maybe you had a falling out. Maybe you got mad at each other. I mean, maybe you just flat out let each other have it, buddy. I mean, no holes barred. But you see, after the episode is over, uh, it's not over in here. You want to hurt them. See, you won't let it die. You keep going after them. You want to tear them down. Let me tell you right now. If you don't, if you're not now, you are you are ready to cross that barrier into hate, and you once you do reach that point of hatred, it will eat you alive. Not your enemy, you. It will destroy you. It will rob you. The fact of the matter is, you want to get in a psycho babble. They say sometimes people eating up with hate are eating up. Period. That it can bring on cancer, bring on early death, high blood pressure, all kinds of stuff that can be brought on by hate. And so the Lord met me at the door and said, that's enough, son. I know you got mad and I know you're mad about certain things. But you, I won't let you cross that barrier, that line, that mark. I won't let it happen. I said, yes, Lord. And I felt good afterward. I felt good because I agreed with him. Now, how many of you have listened to me long enough to know what it said in 1 John chapter number 1? If we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That confession means that I agree with God before it ever is manifested in, phys in any kind of a physical thing. Sin does not originate with your hands, folks. It starts in here. And if you'll listen to God, 1 John chapter number 1, he will deal with the root of it before it ever manifests itself and you can walk in fellowship with God. And don't ever let anybody tell you they don't sin. They're delusional. But this is how you walk in fellowship because fellowship with God's far more important to me than that. Amen. Y'all try to get up here and preach every once in a while. <laughs> Y'all try it. Amen. Y'all try it. Get up here and open up the Bible and have all these people faces looking at you and have something you're going to give to them. You're going to help them. You're going to say something that's going to help them. That ain't easy. So I open up and I come clean with you. And the reason I do is because I want fellowship with God. I'm not perfect. If you're looking for a perfect preacher, I'm gone today. I mean, you're not going to find one. I want the power of God in this church. I want the power of God in my life. So forgive. Amen. Forgive and forget. Let me read you a story from the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. It's a civil war, folks. The northern tribes, the southern tribes. There's ten in the north, two in the south. Benjamin and Judah in the south and the rest in the north. And David waxed stronger and stronger and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. So we have a civil war going on in Israel. Brother against brother. I don't know of anything worse. 2 Samuel chapter number 2 and verse 25. Listen to this carefully. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and became one troop and stood on the top of an hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab answered him, now we're looking folks at commanding generals. This is what we've got here. These are commanders. They've got thousands of men underneath them. They're speaking to each other. And Joab said, as God liveth, unless thou hadst spoken, surely then in the morning the people had gone up every one from following his brother. In plain words, if you hadn't spoken, if you hadn't made this movement toward me, we would have been locking horns again in battle. But Joab blew a trumpet and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more neither fought they any more so they had peace the civil war died isn't that good that's a good thing and for historical references there's only one king that Israel ever had that pulled all 12 tribes together and they served him faithfully and that was David no other king that ever served that ever stood in Israel or uh, Judah in the south, Israel in the north, ever pulled them all together again. Even as good as Hezekiah and Josiah and men like that, they still, only David could pull them together. And David's a type of Christ. So what's that mean? That means Christ can pull us together. That's what that means. He can pull us together. Are we not here for Christ? Are we not here because of the blood? Are we not here because we've been born again? Are we not here because we want to see people saved? Are we not here today to glorify God and worship his holy name? Amen. Sure we are. That's what we're here for. The apostle said, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. When you open the pit of hell and let a demon out, it may, and you may sick it on someone. And when it gets done eating it, it'll turn on you and come right back to where it started. That's right. When you open the gates of hell, my dear friend. The gates of hell are not going to be your friend. Out they come and out they go. So the forgiveness and the past. Yes, sir. Walk in the spirit, he said. In Galatians 5, this I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Let me tell you something about the law. The law will always tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. It has its demands it will lay on you. All right? 
The law, the law, the law. Strengthen yourself in the law. But let me tell you something about the law. You ever turn on the law or you break the law, there's nothing in that law to lift you up and help you and forgive you and cleanse you. The law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. It brought us in total frustration before God when the Apostle Paul said, none keep the law. And they don't. Nobody. Keep. They call him antinomian. That's just a big word simply mean namas is law, anti-law. That's what they say of Paul, that he's antinomian. Who calls him that? The people that call him that are those who want to live by the law. Well, the Bible said you live by the law or you'll die. You keep the law or you'll die. If you think by keeping a law that you've got laid out before you, that's going to keep you right with God and it's going to give you peace and joy, you're dead wrong, my dear friends. You're dead wrong. It won't do it. The only thing that can give you peace with God is the blood of the Lord Jesus that finished the work at Calvary and paid the demands of the law and satisfied the wrath of God and the propitiation for our sins. And he's the atonement. He brought us into a relationship with God that nothing could do. It was the Christ. It was his sacrificial death, his expiation, which means that he made peace between God and man. And that's at the cross and nowhere else. So, the Bible says if you live after the flesh, you'll die. So what's the flesh? Well, how many's ever heard the word psychosomatic? It's a big word, they, you know, big word. What's that mean? It's a conjunction of two Greek words. Suke, which means soul. Soma, somatic, soul, body, body, soul. In other words, it is a sickness that is brought on not because of, a, because of a disease or a germ. It's a sickness that's brought on because of what's going on in your head. That's psychosomatic, okay? Soma, body, psyche, soul, pneuma, spirit. But there's another word in Greek that's translated flesh, and it's sarx, sarx. And this word has more to do not so much with the physical flesh itself as it does with a spiritual entity. The old man, the old nature. Now, if you, have, if you are a natural man today or a carnal-minded person today, you have nothing to compare with what I'm about to say because you've only got one nature. That's the old nature. You see, most people who have never been born again when they see somebody like me up there, they say, well, he's probably a pretty good old boy. You know, he's moral and trying to do the best he can. And, and he's got his, uh, his standards and, 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 you know, that's good for him. You know, relativity and all that. So, you know, best he can do. But they don't understand that literally there are two souls up here before you right now. There's a soul of an unsaved man that I looked at in that mirror. And this is what we're talking about in the flesh. This is where I allow that unsaved, that old man, that old mind. I allow him to become dominant in my life. And when I allow him to become dominant in my life, then he takes over. And boy, will he ever take he, He's never satisfied. He'll take over. I mean, he will take over. I mean, he'll take over. <laughs> yes, he will. And that is the old nature, the old man. And he is, he, is, he is incompatible. He's no friend of the new man. But the new man, which is created in the image of Christ, the new man is born again. He's born of the Spirit of God. So I've got an old man and a new man up here before you today. Now, you've been to churches and heard preachers preach. Sometimes you hear the old man preach. Well, you say, you mean to tell me that an unsaved man can preach? Well, he can scream, yell, stomp, sweat, you know, go through the whole most... Well, you better believe a lot of a lot of a lot of what you hear coming out of the pulpit's coming out from the old man. And here's how to tell the old man: the old man gets lifted up, the old man gets glorified, the old man gets justified. The old man is the one who living by his own righteousness. And and you can you can detect it, you can discern it. It doesn't take long. You can get to, you can get through it. But if he's the new man, it's not about him anymore. It's not about my righteousness. It's not about me. It's about Christ. The new man will preach the Lord Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And he's justified by his finished work. That's the new man. So the flesh 
And the old, man, the old man, the flesh, and the new man are in constant struggle, one with the other. The old man, the new man, the old man, the new man. So at three o'clock this morning when God met me in the bathroom, the old man had been right, he'd been coming up. Yeah, that one that for 27 years, I went all over the world in the military and saw an awful lot of stuff out there that I wish I'd never seen. That old man, that old man, buddy, that old man began to rise up. But he can put on religious robes. Oh, he can sound sweet, good, holy, and pious. But aren't you glad for the intervention of the Holy One? And immediately the old man was put down and the new man I put on. Put on the new man, he said. Put him on, I put him on. I did, I put on the new man. And then the joy of the Lord came back in my soul. Not eat up with hate. Praise God, I don't want it. I refuse it. I reject it. I don't want to see anybody hurt. I don't want to see anybody torn down. I don't want to see anybody. I don't. I don't want to see it. Now, if you're eating up with that today, you need to get right with God. You need to do it. Because it's going to eat you alive. It's going to ruin your home. It's going to ruin your health. It's going to ruin your family. It's going to ruin your friends. You're going to find yourself in, in the latter stages of your life. Nobody wants to be around you. Because you're full of hate. Well, they've wronged me, preacher. I know they wronged me too. Have you ever been wronged? Have you been lied on? Well, of course. But I don't live in that. I can't live in that. And I sure can't get up here and preach to you. So God let me go so long. And thanks be unto God. A voice that I hadn't heard in a long time speaking like that to me said, That's it, son. Now. And immediately I said, I know who you are. I know what you're saying. Amen, 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 amen. And he said, Now go in there and lay down and go back to sleep. <laughs> amen. So I got in the rack, rolled over, and I went to sleep. Amen. For me, I had a heart problem in 2012. I have not slept all night long in over 12 years. It just doesn't happen. But that's okay. I'm not complaining because God's been good to me. And when I go to bed and, and hit the rack, if, I'm, if I get to sleep two or three hours, I've done something. I'm up again, go back to bed again, sleep another two or three hours, I'm doing good. So if I only get up, say, two times in a night or maybe three, I, my wife will say, well, how'd you do last? I said, I did fine. I did real good. I only got up three times. Now, I remember when I was 17 years old, I'd hit the rack and I wouldn't roll and move until the next morning when I got up. See, but I'm not 17 anymore. <laughs> Amen. Add 60 to that. That's where I am now. Thank God, though, I can lay down and I can rest and I got peace in my soul and I give God glory this morning. And I ask you, if you need to do it, if you need to come, why don't you do it? Come and do it. Come, come right now and say, God, cleanse my heart. Let, let the same thing happen to me that happened to that preacher. He only, you met him and told him that was it, no further, and he listened and he stopped it and that's it and it's over. And do it. Won't you do it? Amen? Won't you do it? Get up out of your seat and come down here this morning. And there's some in your life, some sin, some hidden thing. You got an affair going on? What are you? Are you, are, are you sneaking around, staggering around? Are you on, are you on, are you on drugs? What are you doing? Is your, t is, is your computer full of pornography? What's happening with you? What kind of life are you living? Let me tell you something. You're not hiding it from God. You can't hide from God. You can't hide from Him. So why don't you come down here this morning and turn it over to the Lord and say, Lord, here it is. Cleanse me of this. The old man who wants to destroy my life. And he does. He destroyed mine in a heartbeat. The old man. Why don't you come down here and confess it to God. He'll cleanse you, forgive you, and he'll restore you. In Jesus' name, bow your head. Father, Lord, I've confessed my soul. And Heavenly Father, I'm the place in life, Lord, where it matters to me far more my relationship with you than what people think of me. That means more, far more to me that I walk with thee, Lord, and I know that I'm right with you. That matters to me. That means everything. And I pray that you'd use the testimony now and the witness and what I said in a good way, somehow or another, that can help people 
And they deal with these issues, our Father. I pray it in Jesus' name. They deal with these issues. Amen. Won't you come? Let's stand up here, brother. Why don't we go sing a song here? Give an opportunity. Page 150. Opportunity. Page 150. Opportunity. Page 150. Opportunity. Page 150. Opportunity. It's good. Good to be here. Looks like we got some folks visiting with us over here. We're glad to have you. But you make yourself right at home with us tonight. All right. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse number 2. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. The divine text says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Father, bless this word in thy name, I pray. Amen. Now here's what Daniel chapter number 7 and verse 22 says. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Judgment given to the saints. The Apostle Paul says, we shall judge angels, and the Apostle says that we shall judge the world. Now, what qualified our Lord Jesus Christ to judge the sinner as his relationship to God and salvation is the fact that he became a man, lived amongst us, and lived a sinless, perfect life. When he did that, he bought the right to come into the presence of God because he becomes the representative man because he's the last Adam, the second man, unique in that sense. And what we have here tonight, it says in the book of 1 John, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he appears or when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now that's quite a thing when you think about that tonight. I was sitting this morning and looking out into the woods and I like to sit early in the morning and think. And uh, I've noticed the last few days, I don't know what's going on around here, but the birds aren't singing. Are they singing where you live? They're not singing where I am. I don't know what's happening. Birds aren't singing. I'm getting mad about this. Something's going on here. <laughs> But in any event, I listen to those birds, and I listen for the first one. Uh, and sometimes that first one gets eager, and he'll start singing before it gets light. You can hear them in the dark. So the birds naturally are singers. Think about that. They sing. Here in Tennessee, we have what's called a mockingbird. How many of you know that's the state bird here in Tennessee? They did a thing on the Heartland series about this mockingbird to see if, uh, if it was really mocking the sounds of other birds or simply giving out, uh, uh, you know, word salad. You ever heard that word before? But in any event, they did a survey and found out, yes, this mocking bird is mocking the sounds of the birds around. So the mocking bird, yeah, the mocking bird here in Tennessee. So the scripture says that we're going to judge now, the Bible talks about the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema. It's where we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Only the saved. This is what he says in the book of Corinthians. And we'll receive the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. That ought to be something to motivate us to live right. Because we will appear at the judgment seat of Christ. You have the judgment of the nations that takes place at the end of the millennium to determine whether they go into the, uh, whether at the beginning of the millennium, whether they go into the millennium or not, the judgment of the nations. And what's the criteria for how God's going to judge the nations? Well, it's the end of the times of the Gentiles. Started at 606 B.C. And it finishes when God smites that image on its feet and destroys the Gentile kingdoms, and they come tumbling down. And, of course, the United States of America is part of the Gentile kingdoms. He did not say, I, upon this rock I'll build my kingdom. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm not here building kingdoms. I'm here watching him build his church as we preach the gospel. Uh, I want to disassociate myself as much as I possibly can from that image of 606 B.C. in the plains of Dura when Nebuchadnezzar had that vision 
about the Gentile kingdoms. I want to disassociate myself. I belong to the church of God. That's who I am. I'm a bishop in the church of God. And I'm happy with that and will be as long as I'm in this world. Then there's the final judgment called the great white throne judgment. We read about it in the book of Revelation. The books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And they were judged according to the things in those books. And if the name was not found written, then they were cast into a lake of fire. This is the judgment of the great white throne judgment. We do judgments every day of our life. We make decisions. That's a constant thing. That's part of life. You have to make judgments. And as you mature and get older, you realize that the choices you made yesterday or the day before or a year ago, you may just now be paying the price for them. Because you will. God's no respecter of persons. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But I want you to notice something that's important about us. Uh, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 15, here's what it says. Hebrews 4, 15. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, God, the Bible said God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's what the book says. The Lord Jesus Christ was not a sinner. He never sinned. Never, ever sinned. The Lord Jesus was righteous. And the Lord Jesus established a righteousness when he lived in this world that never existed till he showed up. And it's the righteousness of the God-man. And that's the righteousness that you have been given once you belong to the, Lord, to the Lord God because we might be made the righteousness of God in him, the righteousness of the God-man. We have a very close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ tonight that the world does not have. I've told you how before that man was made in the image of God. He sinned. He lost a good bit of that image. When Christ came, he restored the image that Adam lost. I want to give you four big points. There's many more, but here are four of the important things about that image. Number one, we are created in the image of God. That image has been restored at the moment of the new birth. When you were born of the Spirit of God, the image is restored. Thanks be unto God. Number two is the fact that you have the capacity to love. You can love. You can love God back the way he loves you. And that's a big deal, folks. There's not a word in that Bible from Genesis to Revelation that says an angel or a cherubim or a seraphim loves God. And you can come to the conclusion that they are incapable of it. But whatever you decide to do with the matter, you can't find it in the Bible where it says they love God. The second thing, or third thing rather, is prayer. God Almighty never prayed till he became a man. And when the Lord Jesus Christ the God-man showed up on this earth, I don't think anybody ever prayed more than him. And I don't think anybody ever prayed like him. He would spend whole nights in prayer. Why? Because he was the God-man. What is prayer? Someone says, well, it's simply talking to God. No, my dear friend, it is far more than talking to God. Prayer involves God talking to you. That's what he talks about in 1 John chapter number 1. Prayer is a reciprocal communication with the Almighty. He has one he can speak to. When you pray, God has reserved within your essence an area that he can communicate to like no other creature on this earth. Now, I'm not saying unsaved men don't pray. That's not what I said. I didn't say you never heard me say that. But what I'm talking about tonight is the prayer of the saint, the prayer of the saved that he's talking about in 1 John chapter 1. That if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and we have that fellowship. That is the fourth biggie, and that is fellowship. The fellowship we have with the Father and with the Son. There's nothing in the Bible that says an angel, cherubim, seraphim, or certainly an unsaved man has fellowship with God. They do not. But if you're born again, you must have. Because if you don't have fellowship with the Lord, there's no way you're going to be able to live for the Lord. What you get from fellowship is the strength. You get understanding. You get direction. You get light. You get, the, you get that spiritual, uh, what I, I don't know if one of a better word, a spiritual charge from God, the power of the Holy Ghost, to be able to live a Christian life and live it in fellowship with the Lord. So to love, to love like God loves, 
That raises you up above every creature there is. Amen. To have prayer like God put within you, the God man. Satan talks to God. He talked to God. He talked to God in the book of Job. Hast thou considered my servant Job? Satan said, you got a hedge built around him. He communicated with him. But that's not prayer. But you can. And I hope you are. And so fellowship is a wonderful thing. Now here's what's going on with this though. The Lord Jesus Christ was never redeemed from being a sinner. How many of you agree with that? But we have been. So the Bible talks about the fact that we will judge people one day. Now think about that. And the indication is from the book of Daniel chapter number 7, the judgment takes place as they enter into the millennium. You have the judgment of nations in a collective body as they enter the millennium. But you also have judgment of individuals as they enter into the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. It might be quite a thought for, to think that God is preparing us, Christians tonight, preparing believers. I mean, after all, I did come out of darkness. I came from the dark world. I was unsaved. I was lost without God. The Lord Jesus was never that, but I was. But then I've crossed over. Now here I am, a son of God by the new birth. Angels are sons of God by creation. They're called that in the Old Testament. The sons of God, the book of Job, shouted when God created in the creation. But I'm a son of God by birth. And this is why the apostle John in 1 John says, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him. We're sons of God. And not only that, but we are a member of the church of the firstborn. The firstborn. The first ones born of the Holy Spirit. The first ones born of the Spirit of God. That's who we are. That's what we are. We're a church of the firstborn. And that's, uh, that's quite a thing to put upon it because it makes you think, maybe this explains a lot of the things that I've had to go through in my lifetime. Do you know, I, fir I firmly believe that the best minister to a drug addict is a former drug addict. I do. I believe that. I do believe that. I believe that's the best minister to a, to a drug addict. It's not that you can't preach the truth to anybody. You can. That's what we preachers do. But the truth is, a former drug addict can relate to that other, to the drug addict. And a former drug addict, a lot of times, can tell if they're being played with. Don't you think? that you're able to read a drug addict like I'm not able to do that. By the grace of God, that's one demon I didn't have to deal with. I've had plenty of them, believe me. And I'm not saying I'm any better than anything, but that's one I didn't have to deal with. But if, you've been, but if you have been a drug addict, you know the world that a drug addict lives in. You know the temptation, you know the weakness, you know the pain, the sorrow, the crying, the broken homes, the promises, the broken promises, all that a drug addict will go through. Now, I've pastored a long time, folks, and I've pastored a lot of people hooked on drugs. As a matter of fact, I've buried a few of them. Their bodies, anyway, of course, you know, I don't bury anybody, but I've buried the bodies of a number of people that were drug addicts. And I have never, and do I do not intend tonight to start out a ministry of condemnation it's not my job to condemn. My job is to preach the gospel. The Bible said in Romans 8, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. My job is to get the word of God out. God is the ultimate judge in this life in a way that I could never judge. But when he uses people in the ministry, he will use them. For example, a broken home, that's a hard thing to deal with. And this is why if you'll see me sometimes warm up to little children, You'll see me warm up to them because I was five years old when I knocked on the door of my grandfather's house with my two-year-old brother, and he gave us a home. I know what that's like. I understand. I know what that's like. I didn't get that from a book. I got that from a life. So I can feel. They, little children want stability. They want somebody to love them. They, man. That, I, I can't stand the thought of treachery when it comes to little children. This is why I support uh, some charitable organizations outside the church uh, because they deal with little children and they're trying to help them. And I'm the first one to get in line when it comes to that. 
because that's my life. That's the way I grew up. Now, a lot of people didn't grow up like that. You grew up with a good mother and a good father and, uh, and a good home. God bless you. That's good. I did not. I had no mother and I had no father, but I had a grandfather. And I know now what it is. I knew what it was to have, have one love me. When you have Mother's Day and you rejoice about your mother, good for you. God bless you. But man, if I told you some of the things that my mother did and some of the things she said to me, you'd die. You could, you'd die. You, you would probably wouldn't even believe it. Well, God knows. But he brought me out of it. You understand? This is, why, this is what ministry is about. It's about, relate, it's about a minister being able to relate to certain people more than he can to others. And some of you in this house tonight, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And you should be seeking the face of the Lord to find out if he's called you into some of these ministries to minister to people. The Bible says that you minister the ministry that's been given to you, the gifts that have been given to you, the light that's given to you, the grace of God that's given to you. So this is an important thing because what you're doing, you are being prepared for a time when you are going to judge people. Now, a lot of translators, they, when you get into a word like judge, they like to say, well, that's simply, that's a euphemism for ruling over people, reigning over people, this, that, this, that. But if you'll notice the context, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and verse number 2. Look at the, let the Bible define itself. Look at the context of, uh, of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Let me find it here. It's quite a remarkable thing when you look at it. All right, here we go. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse number, uh, verse number 5. I speak to your shame. It is so that there is not a wise man among you. Is it so that there's not a wise one? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brother. Now look at verse 6. Brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. In other words, into a court of law suing his brother. See, have you ever seen that happen? Well, of course, we had one drag us into a court of law one time here. And he was the perpetrator. Yeah, he was. He was the perpetrator. But he turned around and sued us and sued this church and tried to extort X number of dollars from it. And there's nobody in here tonight. You probably don't know him. We're not jumping on anybody. It's been a while since it's happened, so everybody can rest easy. <laughs> but the truth is, that happened. And I couldn't believe it because it was the very perpetrator, the one that did the deed, that turned around and sued the church. See what, get, see what you get into in church? Hey, man, every, every, kind of, <laughs> every kind of a person there is in this world... Well, how you doing, brother? Have a seat. Sit down. Yeah, glory to God. But you better watch them. <laughs> Some of you better not turn your back on them. Amen. Now, I speak from experience. But in any event, he said, don't go to court with each other. Don't drag each other into a court of law and suing each other. And that is a general, a good general principle to abide by and live by. And don't try to hurt each other and don't try to destroy each other. And don't try to take everything one of your brothers or your sisters has. Leave that to God. He'll take care of that stuff. You don't need to go. You don't need to try to tear each other up. You need to pray for one another and bear one another's burdens. So we're being prepared. And a thought came to my mind. It's quite remarkable. This came to me this morning as I was sitting out there meditating, talking to God. It came to my mind. My goodness, Lord. Uh, you have, in a unique way, qualified us to do something our Lord Jesus Christ could not do because he does not know what it feels like to sin. How many agree with that tonight? This is why he said you're sons of God. This is why you go into the millennium. This is why you better be careful tonight about, uh, about how you deal with stuff like this. Look at Romans chapter 8 and verse number 19. Now, you folks know me. You ought to know that I in no way am trying to belittle the Lord Jesus Christ. Good night, man. He's our life, our faith, our hope, everything. He's all there is. We're nothing without him. But in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 19, but don't let somebody call me up and say, well, now, preacher, uh, maybe he did overcome sin. No, he didn't overcome sin. He was no sinner. He never sinned. 
He was perfect. Amen. Perfect. Amen. And then you get into this big argument. I might as well put it out while I'm at it. Well, he could have sinned. One group says that. Another group says, no, he could not have sinned. I'm that group. I do not believe he could have sinned. But I do know people who, th who think he could have. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 19. Now look at this. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of what? The sons of God. That's us. You see, we're going to leave here, and during the, uh, during the tribulation period, time of Jacob's trouble, we'll have the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there'll be a lot of things taking place during that period of time. And then at the second advent, the second advent, which is at the end of the millennium, when he comes out of heaven and there heaven opens, my friend, he's going to bring us with him. Yes, he is. He's going to bring us with him. And we will be prepared. I want you to look at the book of Obadiah, verse, uh, uh, verse 21. Obadiah, let's see, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So between Amos, Obadiah, Jonas. Between Amos and Jonah is Obadiah. He's a real small, short book. He's what they'll teach you in Bible college is a minor prophet. I never did like terminology of major prophets and minor prophets. Never did like that. I mean, what do you mean, minor? <clears throat> He's a prophet, isn't he? Prophet's a prophet. But look at verse number 21. This is a, de this is, uh, look at verse 17. Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Well, if you go to Romans 11, you'll see that that's the second advent. Now look what it says in verse 21. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. See how the kingdom's given to him? Now who are these saviors? Well, let me tell you something. An angel never has nor ever will it save you. Now an angel may save you in the sense he, like a guardian angel, watch over you, keep you safe in something that happens in this world, but he cannot redeem your soul. He cannot save you like our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. You see, all you have to do is touch Christ, take him into your heart, and you're saved. He doesn't have to say you're saved. He that hath the Son hath life. You follow me? Just to have him is to have eternal life. And to have him is a simple thing. See, if you notice now why they're called saviors? Well, I told you in 1 John that we'll be like him. Look at Revelation 19, verse 14. Revelation 19, verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Obviously, he's not coming for a peace powwow. He's coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords, but what follows him? Armies. See this? Armed, armed believers. Uh, in chapter number 20 and verse number 4, look at this. I saw thrones and they sat upon them. Judgment was given to them and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And look at this. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. See the reigning? Uh, what does a king do? He reigns. You see? He reigns. A king does. Depending on what kind of king you've got, if it's Nebuchadnezzar, he's an absolute monarch. What's that mean? If he says, you die, you die. No extenuating circumstances, you know, no pleas, nothing. No, no appellate court. You're dead. That's an absolute monarch. And uh, <laughs> in some cases, it's been like that. When he comes, he brings, the, he brings the armies. Now, in chapter number 20 and verse number 4, it says they reigned a thousand years with Christ. Now, a lot of people say, well, no, that's symbolic. Uh, he's really reigning right now. Well, there's so many things. You know, I'd, it'd be nice if he was, but he's not. Because there's too many things happening right now. The righteous reign of Christ is an entirely different time. Look at Zechariah chapter number 8 and verse number 23. It's the last book in the Old Testament before the last book in the Old Testament. The book of Zechariah chapter number 8 and verse number 23. Now, 
It's just remarkable. Zechariah 8, 23. All right, here we go. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Yeah. Well, right now, you see, they're enemies of the gospel. And right now, they're blinded. But the day is going to come when they are elevated to the head of all the nations again. And salvation will come out of Zion. Yes, Israel. Yes, yes. Now, look at the context. Look at Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 11. Hebrews 8, 11. Now, if you start reading in verse number 10 to get the context, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. This is a quotation from Jeremiah. Now look at verse 11. Now watch this closely. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. In the book of Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 9, it says the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There's coming a time when no one, no one can say that I haven't heard the gospel or I don't have any light or no truth. The time is going to come when we will reign with Christ for a thousand years and judge. That's right, judge. And elevated as sons of God, now, don't ever listen to a charismatic or a Pentecostal or somebody tell you, we become God. You cannot become God. That's an impossibility. You cannot become God. God could become a man. But the Lord Jesus never gave up his deity. He was still the second person of the Trinity. You see, they, fall, they fell down before him and worshipped him, and rightfully so, because he's God. But you cannot become God. That's an absolute impossibility. But if you notice, the knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Is this the tribulation period? No. This is the millennium. It's the preparation for that final judgment. Now, I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 14. And I'll bring you down to a close by using this. Matthew chapter number 12 and verse number 14. You've been through it with me before, but maybe tonight it'll begin, to, it'll begin to take hold for you, help you. In Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 14, remember now, the Gospel of Matthew is the offering of the kingdom right here on this earth, right here, a kingdom, right here. Now look at verse 14, Matthew 12. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him how they might destroy him. Now remember what you just read. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. In plainer words, during the earthly kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, everybody is going to know him. See, they're going to know him. Now look what happens. When they reject him, the kingdom has been offered. The kingdom has been offered. But now they're rejecting him. They held a council to destroy him. Look what immediately follows. Chapter 13. And then in verse number one, the same day went Jesus out of the house, sat by the seaside, great multitudes gathered together to him, so that he went into a ship and sat in the whole multitude, stood on the shore, and he spake to them many things in parables. See that? That's immediately what follows. Now here's the Bible defining what that means. And this is what's so important about it. Some folks say, well, a parable is, a, is an earthly message with a heavenly meaning. That's all fine. But put it in context. What's it mean? What's this about? Why the parable? It tells you. Look at verse number 3. A sower went forth to sow. What follows is the parable. Now look at verse number 11. Uh, here's the question is asked in verse 10. 
the disciples came and said to him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? That's a, that's a good logical question. I mean, if you want a knowledge of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea and you're bringing the kingdom, why are you speaking in parables, in, in hidden phrases? Why? He quotes Isaiah 6. Then he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And then what follows in verse number 14, same chapter, is a judicial declaration. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, shall not understand, seeing you shall see, shall, shall, see, shall not perceive. This people's heart is waxed gross, their eyes are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see your ears, for they hear. And he has shut their eyes and their ears. Now watch what happens when we come down to the final declaration of God's relationship to the Jew and how it turns to the Gentile. Look at the last chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 28. He quotes that scripture again. Acts chapter 28. And verse 23. When they had appointed him a day, there came many to, him to his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses, out of the prophets. That's two of the three divisions of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim. And out of the prophets from morning till evening, some believed the things which were spoken, some believed not. When they agreed not among themselves, now look carefully, we're talking to Jews. They departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Esaias the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, say, Hearing ye shall hear, shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them be it known therefore unto you he did not say that salvation is only for the Gentiles that's not what he said but here's what he said this is the main direction of it in verse number 28 be it known therefore unto you that salvation the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and they will hear it. Are you following that? That's pretty good. And I mean, that's a general type survey of what we're talking about. There's a lot of specifics involved in it. So, preacher, the knowledge of the Lord does not cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. No, it doesn't. That's one.